What's up? I'm Vin, and today I'm going through this AP Calculus BC Unit 9 practice test, and I'll leave a link to a copy of this test in the description below. Now let's get started. Question one, we want to know for what values of t does the curve given by the parametric equations given here have a vertical tangent? So when you hear vertical tangent, you should be thinking about where is the slope of the tangent line undefined, okay? So what I'm thinking about here is where is dy dx undefined? Because when we have some curve, let's say it looks like this, this would be a location where we have a vertical tangent. We're going to be looking for where is dy dx undefined. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. And what that means is we're going to have our derivative expressed as a fraction. We're going to be setting the denominator of our fraction equal to zero. Okay, so we're going to set the denominator equal to zero. So now let's go ahead and find dy dx. So dy dx in the parametric world, we're going to say is equal to dy dt over dx dt. And if you just did the algebra here, you could see that dt over dt would cancel, bringing you right back to dy dx. So now this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the derivative of the y equation with respect to time. Okay, so we're finding dy dt first. So we're going to have in the numerator here, we're going to have 6t to the fifth. So we're just using the power rule to derive this equation. And then we have plus the derivative of 3t squared is 6t. And then we have minus the derivative of 12t is 12. Okay, and then for the denominator, now we're going to focus on finding dx dt. So now we could derive this piece. And we're going to have 3t squared minus 6t. Okay, the derivative of minus 2 just goes to 0. And remember, the thought process, we're going to set the denominator equal to 0. So now we're going to say dy dx is undefined when 3t squared minus 6t is equal to zero. And now just do the algebra. So this we could say, we could factor out 3t and we're left with t minus two. And this is gonna give us two roots. We're gonna have a root at t equals zero and we're gonna have a root at t equals two. So just doing this math, I could see choice C is our answer. Now, one other answer that jumped out at me was choice D. This one has one extra answer. But if we were to plug in t equals one to our derivative, notice what that would do. That would make the numerator equal to zero. So you could see, we'll just make that a little bit neater. If we were to plug one in to the top, like notice this top piece here, we'd have six plus six minus 12, and that's equal to zero. If we plugged in one to the bottom, that would give us three minus six, which is equal to negative three. And if I did zero divided by negative three, that would give us a dy dx value of zero, which would give us a horizontal tangent, okay? So that would be if we were looking for where we have a horizontal tangent that would be one of the values to consider, okay? But we're looking for where we have a vertical tangent. So choice C is our answer. Question two, we have a curve defined by these parametric equations given here. And we wanna know for what value of t, where t is between zero and 10, is the second derivative equal to three? So for this question, we have to know what is the formula for the second derivative of a parametric curve? And that's a formula that I just cannot memorize. So what I do is I take the derivative with respect to x of dy dx, and I remembered from before that dy dx is expressed as a function of time. So considering that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the chain rule here. I'm going to swap out d over dx with d over dt. So I'm gonna take the derivative with respect to time of dy dx, but then I'm gonna multiply by dt over dx. Okay, you could even see here that if I were to cancel these out here, it would bring us right back to where we started. But now I'm gonna do something a little bizarre here. I'm gonna leave d over dt with dy dx, and then I'm going to kind of like go backwards with division here. I'm gonna express this as a fraction over dx dt. All right, you might be thinking, why on earth would anybody do that? But that's to give us the formula for the second derivative of a parametric curve, okay? I'm kind of like, if you know the mnemonic keep change flip for dividing fractions, I'm kind of doing that backwards, okay? So this is the formula that we need. So now dy dx, we're gonna have to use the same formula from before. Okay, so remember this was equal to, from before we had dy dt over dx dt. So I'm just gonna go ahead and derive the y equation and the derivative of this equation here, I just do the power rule, it's gonna give me 3t and then minus five. And then I derive the x equation on bottom and that's gonna give us, we're gonna have t squared minus four. Once again, the formula that I'm using from before, if you just remember the last question, is dy dt over dx dt. So that's what I'm using here. So now our goal is to find the second derivative. 
So now what we're going to find is we have d squared y over dx squared. And I'll just make that a little bit neater. So we have d squared y over dx squared is the derivative with respect to time of this piece. So we do get a calculator for this question. So I can ask the calculator to do this derivative, you know, um, on the main screen of the calculator, uh, but I will show how to do this by hand as well. So we'll have t squared minus four, we're just using the quotient rule here, times the derivative of three t minus five is three, and then minus we'll have three t minus five in parentheses. So we just have to put that part in parentheses. So three t minus five, and then times the derivative of the bottom is two t. And this is all over the denominator squared. So t squared minus four squared, okay? And then we're dividing by dx dt. A common mistake here is students are so proud of themselves that they do this part right, that they forget to divide by dx dt. And dx dt is the same thing as x prime, okay? So x prime of t we found before, that was t squared minus four. So I'm just dividing by an extra t squared minus four. Okay, so we have t squared minus four, and that's what we're dividing by. So if I wanna simplify this a little bit, what I could do is I could just rewrite the top and then I could rewrite the denominator as this factor to the third power. So now our goal here is to find out where is the second derivative equal to three. So I could go over to the y equals now and I'm gonna press alpha y equals enter to pull up a blank fraction and we could type in, we have x squared and then we have minus four. So it doesn't matter that I'm not using t here. I could go ahead and use any variable I want. So I'm just typing in our second derivative here. So we have on the next part here, three, I'm gonna put x minus five times two x instead of t. And then in the denominator, we're gonna have parentheses, x squared minus four. We close the parentheses and we're raising this to the third power. And our goal is to find out when is the second derivative equal to three. And remember the answer choices here were restricted between zero and 10. So I'm gonna to go to the window here and I'm gonna switch the X minimum to zero and the X maximum I'll leave at 10. And if our goal is to see when is the second derivative equal to three, I really just have to look between like, let's say zero and five. That's gonna be more than enough. So I press graph and notice this is where it's happening here, okay? If I zoom out a little bit, you could see you know, what we're looking at. We're between zero and 10. So this really is truly the, the one place that it's going to happen, like for t between zero and 10. If I went into the negatives, like, you know, I'd have another answer, but we want the answer between zero and 10. So second trace five, and now I could scroll up to the point of intersection to trace the intersection point. And I just press enter three times, and here's our solution. So here's our value of t, and we just scan the answer choices, and our answer is gonna match up with choice b. Now, before we move on, let's say you don't wanna do the derivative of dy dx by hand. So we're still using the same formula here, but this time around, I'm gonna press alpha y equals enter to pull up a blank fraction. And in the numerator, we're taking the derivatives, I'm gonna press math eight. We're taking the derivative I'll put with respect to x of this function here. So I'm gonna write another fraction. So alpha y equals enter again, and we have three x minus five, over on bottom here, we have x squared minus four. Okay, so that's this part here. And we're taking the derivative with respect to x. So I know I'm changing the variable here, but that's what we're gonna use. So now in the denominator, the formula tells us to divide by dx dt. So dx dt is still x squared minus four. So I'm just gonna write that once more. So x squared minus four. But now watch what happens. If I press graph, notice that this is gonna give me the exact same situation. And if I press second trace five, and I find that point of intersection. So we'll just get a little bit closer here and just hit left. So enter, enter, enter. And notice that we get the exact same answer, okay? So if you are in the calculator section and you don't feel like doing any derivatives by hand, you can use that nice little shortcut. Question three, we have a curve defined by the parametric equations given here. And we wanna know which of the following is an equation of the line tangent to the graph of the curve at the point where t is equal to two. So to write the equation of a tangent line, we need a point and we need a slope. So we need to know what is the x and y coordinate when t is equal to two. So we're gonna plug in t equals two to the x equation first. So we'll have negative three times two. And this tells us that our x coordinate here is negative six. And then we plug in t equals two to the y equation. 
and that's going to give us we'll have 2 times 2 squared and then minus 2 times 2. So that gives us 8 minus 4 is 4. So here's the point that we're going to write our tangent line through. So this is to get us started. We have the point negative 6, 4. So there's our point. And now to write the equation of a tangent line, we also need to know the slope. So we're going to find the formula for dy dx here, okay, or our equation for dy dx. So now we're going to use the same formula from before. We're doing dy dt over dx dt. Okay, which if I use the language of the question, I could write it like that, or I could say y prime of t over x prime of t. Okay, so this is just another way of expressing it, because in this situation here, we have it in function notation, the parametric equations. So now y prime of t is 4t minus 2, and we're dividing by the derivative of x of t is negative 3. So now if I want to find the slope at t equals 2, I have dy dx at t equals 2. That's going to be equal to, we're going to have 4 times 2 minus 2 divided by negative 3. And that's going to give us 6 divided by negative 3, which is negative 2. So now I have my slope and I have my point. So I could just write the equation of the tangent line. We have negative 2 times x minus minus 6 becomes x plus 6. And on the left side, we have y minus 4. And notice all of the answer choices are in slope intercept form so i need to distribute and solve here so we have negative 2x minus 12 when we send minus 2 through and now we have y minus 4. so then just add 4 to both sides and this is going to give us our answer so our final answer here we have y equals negative 2x minus 8 and this is going to match up with choice b Question four, we have this vector valued function P of T for the position of a particle. And we want to know the magnitude of the velocity vector at T equals two. Well, first we should find the vector valued function for the velocity. And to find the velocity function, we should take the derivative of the position function. So the derivative of the X component, we're just going to do the power rule here, is T squared plus one. And now we're going to derive the Y component and we use the power rule again. And this time we're going to get T to the third and then plus four, okay? So we're just doing the power rule on the x and the y component. And now first we should find what is the velocity vector at t equals two. So v of two, if we plug in two, we're gonna have two squared plus one in the x, and then we have two to the third power plus four in the y component. And this simplifies here to, we'll have four plus one is five, and we'll have eight plus four is 12. So now when you're looking for the magnitude of a vector, what you're really doing here is finding just the length of the vector. So I just imagine like I'm plotting some point here on the xy plane. So the point, let's say 5, 12 would be over here. And that tells us that our velocity vector is going out this distance and it's pointing in this direction here. But to find the magnitude of the vector, what I like to do is just imagine that you're making a right triangle. So I'm going from the origin, I'm going over 5 and I'm going up 12. So if I want to find the magnitude of the vector, all I'm going to do here is find this distance here. So I'm going to do, we're going to have the square root of, and if you want to, you know, actually write it out with the, um, with the notation, you could say the magnitude of the velocity vector at t equals 2 equals. But really, this is just a Pythagorean theorem question. I'm basically just doing on the side here, the side work is 5 squared plus 12 squared is equal to c squared. Okay, if you recognize that this is a 5, 12, 13, you could just say that the magnitude of this vector is 13, and you get choice D. Otherwise, just work this out. 25 plus 144 is 169. And if that's equal to c squared, just take the square root, and this tells you the hypotenuse is 13 units long. Okay, so the magnitude of the velocity vector at t equals 2 is 13. Question 5, we have g is a vector-valued function defined by g of t. And we want to find the second derivative of g. So for this one here, we're just going to find the derivative of g. And then we're going to take the derivative one more time. So what we have, the derivative of sine 3t, just make sure that you are using the chain rule for this piece. So the derivative of sine 3t, we're going to have cosine of 3t times the derivative of 3t is 3. Okay, so remember the chain rule, you're doing the derivative of the outside. You keep the inside the same, and then you multiply everything by the derivative of the inside. 
And now we repeat this for the second part. Now we're taking the derivative of the y component and we have the derivative of e to the minus 2t is e to the minus 2t times the derivative of the exponent is minus 2. So just know the chain rule variant for something like this, this is a popular chain rule variant. When you have e to a constant times x, the derivative is ke to the kx. Okay, so we just, just have to know these you know, basic derivatives here. If you want to write one down also for the sine function, when you have sine of kx, the derivative is k times cosine of kx. All right, or just be really comfortable with the chain rule. Okay, you really just want to make sure that's one of the techniques you show up having mastered for the AP test. And also when you're taking your unit nine test in class. So now for the second derivative, now I'm going to be deriving each of these pieces. So I have the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So I have negative sine 3t. And I'm leaving the coefficient blank right now because there's a 3 in front. When I take the derivative of 3t, I get another 3. And 3 times 3 is going to give us 9. Okay, so this bumps up. And now, same thing here. I'll leave a space. We have e to the minus 2t. That's the first part of the derivative. But now the derivative of the exponent is negative 2. And I have a negative 2 times a negative 2 is a positive 4. Okay, so there is a sign change for that second piece. So now I'm just looking through the answer choices here. And we can see that this is going to match up with choice B. Question six, we have the parametric curve C described by parametric equations x of t and y of t. And t is greater than or equal to zero. And then we're given the derivatives x prime of t and y prime of t. And we want to know what is the length of the curve from t equals one to t equals three. So for this question, we just have to know that the integral of speed tells us distance traveled. And when we're dealing with a parametric curve like curve C, we're going to be using this formula here, x prime of t squared so we have x prime of t squared plus, and then we have y prime of t squared, okay? And this is all under a big square root, okay? So this is what we're finding here, all right? And we're going from one to three. So now what we're gonna do is we could just use the calculator for this, but let's go ahead and practice doing this by hand because these particular equations should work out that we could do this all by hand. So now this is gonna work out to, we're gonna have the integral from one to three and we have the square root of x prime of t squared. If I square both sides, I'm gonna get t squared. Okay, so if I just, once again, just square both sides like this, we're gonna have t squared. And then if I square the second equation like this, squaring the square root is gonna just break the square root and we're gonna have plus four t plus four. And now we tack on dt. Now you might notice here that this trinomial here is a perfect square trinomial, it factors very nicely, this is going to factor to under the square root, we're going to have t plus 2 squared. Now, there is some very subtle math that we have to know here. Technically, something like this, I can't just say t plus 2. This is technically equal to absolute value t plus 2. But if we think about what this looks like, if I sketch this, absolute value would just look something like this, all right? If I drew absolute value of, let's say, t, it's going to look like this. But the plus 2 moves this to the left 2. So the fact that our domain is restricted to t is greater than or equal to zero, and we're looking here from one to three, this tells us that we're on this part of the absolute value function. So we can just say here that this is the integral from one to three of just t plus two dt, okay? Because once again, if I just treated this as an equation where this is like y and let's say t, this would be y equals t plus two, this piece, and then this piece would be the opposite it would be y equals negative and then t plus two. Okay, so that's just one thing here to be mindful of. Small detail, but I did wanna explore that. So now if we're doing this by hand, we're gonna use the fundamental theorem of calculus. So we're gonna have one half t squared, we're anti-deriving the integrand here, plus two t, and we're evaluating this from one to three. So now we just plug in and subtract. We're gonna have one half times three squared is nine, plus two times three is six. And now we're gonna have minus, and we plug in one to this antiderivative, and we're gonna have minus one half plus two. So now we just have to simplify. We'll just write that over here. This is gonna be equal to, we have half of, uh, half of nine is 4.5, or I can even just say nine over two for now. And then I have plus six, and now I'm gonna distribute that minus. I have minus a half minus two. And the reason why I'm leaving this like this, the nine over two, is because I can combine these two. 
9 over 2 minus 1 over 2 is 8 over 2. And then I could combine 6 minus 2 is 4. And I'll have 8 over 2 is 4 plus 4 is equal to 8. So this is going to match up with choice C. Question 7, we have the velocity of a particle modeled by this vector-valued function v of t. t is greater than or equal to 0. And we want to know at what time t is the speed of the particle equal to 5. So for this question here, we have to know this concept, that the position function tells us where the particle is. And if we write the position function as a vector-valued function, the x of t component tells us how far to the left or right the particle is, and the y of t component tells us how far up or down the particle is. And then next we would have the velocity function v of t. And for this vector-valued function, the x component we're calling x prime of t, and the y component we're calling y prime of t. And this is telling us how fast the particle is moving and in which direction. Okay, so that's what the velocity vector is going to tell us. And now last we have the acceleration function a of t, and this is telling us the rate of change of velocity, and we would have x double prime of t, and then we have next to it y double prime of t. Okay, so these are the three functions that we have to know when we're dealing with vector valued functions and particle motion. So here, when they give us the velocity function v of t, what they're telling us here is they're telling us formulas for x prime and for y prime. So looking at this, we could say that x prime of t is equal to, we're going to have t minus 6, and then we're over 2 to the t minus 8. And then next, we have y prime of t is right next to it. y prime of t is going to be the second part here after the comma, and we're going to have y prime of t is equal to and we have negative cosine of 3t. So now when we want to define our speed function, the speed function is equal to, we have the square root of x prime of t squared. So we have x prime of t squared, and then plus y prime of t squared. And they're asking us, when is the speed of the particle equal to 5? So we could take this function here and set it equal to 5. And now what we're going to do is we're going to plug in x prime of t, so we have the square root of x prime of t is this fraction here. So we have t minus 6 over 2 to the t minus 8. And this whole expression here is being squared. And then we'll just make this a little bit neater. And then next to it, we have plus, And then the y prime of t function, we have negative cosine of 3t. And this function here is being squared as well. Okay, And we're setting this equal to 5. And the calculator is going to tell us the value of t. So now for this, we could just go over to mode and we could switch to function mode here. And this we're doing because we're just solving this equation with the calculator. So we have square root of, and then in parentheses, we have this fraction. So I'm going to write alpha y equals enter to pull up a blank fraction. And we have t minus 6, but we'll use x. So we have x minus 6 over 2 to the power, and we're going to say x minus 8. And then this whole fraction here is being squared. So I'm going to close the parentheses and then square it. And then next to it, we have negative cosine of 3t, but we're going to write 3x. Now, this part, we just have to be careful. We close the parentheses around the 3x, and then we close it around the negative cosine, and then we attach the square. And we want to know when is the speed equal to 5. So we just let y2 equal 5. And our domain is t is greater than or equal to 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at 0, and I'm going to stop at Let's say I go out to 11 because 10.757 is an answer. So I want to go out far enough that it's going to hit one of these values here. And we want to know when is the speed equal to 5. So I don't have to go all the way to negative 10. I could go from 0 to 10 like this. So now we press graph. And notice here is our speed function. And well, this represents our speed function here, even though we're writing it in terms of x. And this is the line y equals 5. So that's the point of intersection we care about. So we press second trace 5. And we just get close to the intersection point. We hit enter three times. And this tells us that the time is going to be at 5.264. So our solution to question seven is choice B. Question eight, we have a particle moving in the xy plane. And we're told that the acceleration can be modeled by the vector valued function given here. And then we're told that the vector valued function v of t represents the velocity of the particle. And we're given the initial condition here, v of 1 equals 3 comma 5. And we want to know what is the total distance traveled by the particle from t equals 0 to t equals 2. So for this question, if you know your formulas, the last thing that we're looking for here is the integral from 0 to 2 of the speed function. So we're going to look at the integral from 0 to 2 of square root of, and then we have x prime of t squared. And then after this, 
we have plus y prime of t squared. Okay, so this is all under one radical like this. So this is ultimately what we have to find at the end in order to find the total distance traveled. But what we have at the start here is the acceleration function. We have to note here that the acceleration function is the second derivative of the position function. So we have x double prime of t is equal to 2t plus 1. And we have y double prime of t is equal to negative 2t plus 3. So we're going to use this information here to find x prime of t and y prime of t. So let's find x prime of t. And x prime of t we could say is equal to the integral of x double prime of t. Okay, and for this, we're just going to use the power rule and anti-derive this function here. We're going to have t squared plus t, but we have to remember the constant c. So I'm going to write c sub 1 because a little bit later we're going to have to find y prime of t. And what we were told here, this initial condition, we could say if the velocity at 1 is 3 comma 5, remember velocity is x prime y prime. So we could say from this initial condition here that x prime of 1 is equal to 3. Okay, so that's what we're going to use here. We're going to say x prime of 1 is equal to, and we just plug into this here, we're going to have 1 plus 1 plus c sub 1 is equal to 3. And this tells us that c sub 1 is equal to 1. Okay, let's make that a little bit neater. So I just did a little bit of arithmetic um, fast here. But you can just see 1 plus 1 plus 1 would equal 3. Or you could say 2 plus c sub 1 equals 3 and subtract 2 on both sides. But either way, we're getting this. So this tells us that x prime of t is equal to, and now we just plug in for c sub 1 here, is t squared plus t, and then we have plus c sub 1 is 1. Okay, so this is one piece of the puzzle. And now we're going to find y prime of t. So now we follow a similar thought process, and for y prime of t, we're going to anti-derive y double prime. So the anti-derivative of negative 2t is negative t squared, and then we have the anti-derivative of 3 is 3t. But remember, we're treating this also the same way as we treated this. We're going to have a constant at the end. We'll call this one c sub 2. Okay, and now if we have x prime of 1 is 3, that tells us here this initial condition, we could say that y prime of 1 is equal to 5. So we plug in, we have y prime of 1 is equal to, and if we plug in 1 here, negative and then 1 squared is going to give us negative 1, plus 3, plus c sub 2 is equal to 5. And this gives us, we'll have 2 plus c sub 2 is equal to 5, and this tells us c sub 2 is equal to 3. So we'll just make that a little bit neater. So we have c sub 2 is equal to 3. And now our full equation for y prime, we have y prime of t is equal to, we have negative t squared, plus 3t, and we have plus 3. c sub 2 is equal to 3. So now that we have our full equations here for x prime and y prime, we could just plug this whole expression here into the calculator. So for this part, we have options. We could just type in this whole mess on the main screen, or we could go back to parametric mode here. So we go back to parametric, and now in the x1, y1 spot, we could type in these, these two functions here. So we're going to have t squared, and then we have plus t, and then plus 1. Okay, and for the second function here, we have the y prime equation here. We're going to write in, we have negative t squared, and we have plus 3t, and then plus 3. Okay, and for this part, now we go back to the main screen, and our goal is to find the integral from 0 to 2. So I have math 9, we're going from 0 to 2, and then we're going to type in our square root function in the integrand. So we have square root, and now we have x prime squared plus y prime squared. But x prime I saved in the y, uh, I'm sorry, in the x1 spot. So I press alpha trace x1. That's where we saved x prime. And we attach the square. And then plus, if I want to use this sequence here, I press vars. I could go to the right and go to parametric and select y1. That's where we saved y prime. And we attach a square. So now we just tag on the dt at the end and press enter and we'll have our answer. So our solution to question 8, we have 11.688, so we're going with choice B. Question 9, we have a particle moving, and we're told the position can be modeled by a vector-valued function, p of t. And our goal here is to find the acceleration vector of the particle at t equals pi over 3. So since we're starting with position, first we should find velocity, which is the derivative of position. So when you're deriving a vector-valued function, you just go piece by piece. So first we're going to derive the x component. And the derivative of 3 sine t is 3 cosine t. And then next we shift our focus to the y component. So now we're going to derive this piece here. 
and the derivative of five cosine t is negative five sine t. Okay, so this is what we're doing for this part. And now for the acceleration function, we're going to derive the velocity function piece by piece. So now our focus should shift to the x component of the velocity function. So we're going to be deriving this piece and the derivative of three cosine t is negative three sine t. And then finally, we could look over here at the y component of velocity and we derive this piece, the derivative of negative five sine t would be negative five cosine t, okay? The derivative of sine is cosine. Just be careful with those little sign changes because if you look at all the answers, they're basically waiting for you to mess up one of the signs. Even though this is unit nine, they're still gonna test you on your knowledge of basic derivatives. So now all we have to do is plug in pi over three and we'll be done with this, okay? So we'll just clean that up a little bit. So we're plugging in pi over three into our vector valued function for acceleration. So you have negative three sine pi over three. And then next to it, we have negative five cosine pi over three. So for this, we just have to know our trig values and we have negative three sine pi over three is gonna give us radical three over two and then negative five times cosine of pi over three. So we'll just make that a little neater. So we have cosine at pi over three is a half. And now this will simplify to, we'll have in our vector valued function, we'll have negative three radical three over two for the X component and then negative five halves for the Y component. So we just scan the answer choices here and this is gonna match up with choice A. Question 10, we have a particle is moving along the polar function F of theta so that at any time t seconds, theta equals t. And then we have the function r equals f of theta is measured in centimeters. And the particle is traveling along the curve from t equals zero to t equals two pi seconds. And then we want to know which of the following is the best interpretation of f prime of pi over six in the context of the problem. So for this question here, we could use the calculator. First, let's go over to mode and we're going to switch the calculator to polar mode. So we scroll over to polar. We press enter, and now when we press y equals, notice that we have all these r equal spots here. So we're gonna type f of theta. Notice r equals f of theta, we're writing that here. So we have two sine theta, we close the parentheses, and then we have minus five cosine theta. Okay, and from here, we're just gonna press graph just to get an idea of what's going on. Notice if I go to the window that my theta min and max is from zero to two pi, which matches the interval they gave us. But what we want to know is, what is f prime at pi over 6? Well, if r equals f of theta, what we're looking for is dr d theta. Okay, that's what we're looking for. So I'm going to press second trace, and then we're looking at dr d theta over here, so option 3. And we're just going to type in pi over 6. Okay, so we have at pi over 6. And now we press enter, and notice this gives us the value for our derivative. So notice dr d theta equals 4.232. So that eliminates choices A and B if we look at what the value of the derivative is. But now remember from unit five, if your derivative is positive, that means that your function is increasing. So that means that R is increasing. So it would have to be choice C. But no, be careful, choice C is an epic polar bear trap. All right, you have to be very, very careful when you're dealing with polar. What we should be doing here is we should be plugging in the value of pi over six into the original function for f of theta. And this is the value here for pi over six. If we plug this into the function, notice that we could say here that f of pi over six is equal to negative 3.33, but it is less than zero. Okay, so what this means, if we really focus in on the graph here, is that if we look in the direction of pi over six, pi over six, if we think about it in terms of degrees for a moment, is 30 degrees. But pi over six, if we look in this direction here, notice that the function value at pi over six is negative 3.33. So what that tells us is that our R value, instead of going in this direction, 3.33, we're gonna go opposite of this direction. So I just imagine this angle going all the way through the origin like this. And that tells us we would be going 3.3 this way, okay? So we would be going backwards along this straight line here. So that's a very, very, very sneaky detail because if r is negative, notice here, this tells us that our r value is negative, but dr d theta is positive. That actually tells us the distance of the particle from the origin is decreasing at this time. Because if you think about it, if dr d theta is positive, that means that at this location here, notice we have a r value of negative 3.33. As we start to increase, 
you could just think of the number line. As we increase from negative 3.33, we're increasing towards zero. And if we're talking about an R value, that means the R value, the absolute value of that R value is shrinking. So that's why the distance is the key phrase here is what's going to be decreasing, okay? So just know we could say increasing when the function value and the derivative are the same sign, okay? So in this case here, if we had a positive function value at pi over six and a positive derivative, then we would say increasing. Just know, like, let's say a what if, if we had a scenario like this, what if we had f of pi over six was less than zero and we had f prime of pi over six is less than zero, then we could also say that the distance to the origin is increasing. Because if r is negative and r was decreasing, it would be moving away from the origin even more and more, okay? So this is a sneaky detail, but remember, this is just for polar, okay? This is not, don't transfer this back to the f of x world, okay? This is something when we're dealing with polar, okay, that we use this concept. So choice D is our answer. Now, before we move on, I just want to type second trace value pi over six. And what we're saying for our answer is that the distance of the particle from the origin is decreasing by this rate here, 4.232 centimeters per second. And if I were to type in an angle bigger than pi over six, so a little bit bigger, let's say pi over four, okay? So this is 30 degrees, pi over four is 45 degrees. So now let's pay attention to where I was right now at this moment. I'm gonna write in second trace value and then pi over four. And let's see, where do we land? Notice that it is bringing us closer to the origin. So when we think about what this answer means, the distance of the particle from the origin is decreasing. We moved closer as we plugged in an angle that was close, but bigger than the original angle, okay? If I were to say like, all right, I'm starting at 30, let me, or 30 degrees, let me plug in something like, let's say 250 degrees, like that's way too far. So I plugged something in that's reasonably close and we could see that we are moving closer. So choice D is definitely good. Question 11, what is the area of one petal of the polar curve R equals three cosine five theta shown in the figure above? So for questions like this, we could choose any one of these petals to find the area of, but this one is gonna be the easiest to find the area of because the angles are gonna be closest to zero, okay? So that's the one I like to find the area of, but technically you can find the area of any one of those. And what I like to do to help me find the angles involved, because you can't just guess here, all right? Like if you just try to pick out a random angle and say, all right, this looks like maybe 40 degrees in this direction and 40 degrees in this direction, like it's already gonna be off, all right? You need a precise way of getting those angles. And the key is thinking about what do these locations have in common? This angle and this angle is where R is equal to zero, okay? So a big idea is set R equal to zero. And what that's telling you when r is equal to zero, it's telling you when you're at the origin. Because think about it, when you're making one of these petals, you're going away from the origin, r is increasing, and then r starts to decrease and you come back. Okay, so in terms of determining the limits of integration, you wanna know when is r equal to zero. So what I'm looking at here is I think of the cosine function. So cosine of x, let me just bring this back to pre-calculus, cosine of x, if I look at this, it starts off here and it goes down and then up. And what we should know is that it hits zero at pi over two, okay? So it's hitting the x axis at, and it's hitting here y equals zero at x equals pi over two. And then the next time it hits the x axis would be at three pi over two. Okay, so this is what I'm looking at. And if I go backwards, okay, like this, it's also gonna hit the x axis in this direction at negative pi over two. So these are the significant values that we need. So then what I target is the inside of my cosine function. So what I need to happen is I need five theta. I need five theta to be equal to pi over two. Okay, if the inside of this cosine function equals pi over two, then we're going to have r equals zero. So now to solve for theta, I just divide both sides by five, or I can multiply both sides by one fifth. And this tells us that theta equals pi over 10. And now since these are symmetric, I could just say that this angle here is pi over 10, and I could say that this angle underneath is negative pi over 10, okay? But if you really want peace of mind, what you could do is you could set five theta, so we could solve another equation. We set five theta equal to negative pi over two, okay? So I'm setting it equal to this. 
So I'm just thinking about all the times that the standard cosine function is equal to zero. And these are the significant values that I'm setting the inside equal to. So now this gives us theta equals negative pi over 10, okay, which supports exactly what I was saying over here. So now we want the area of one petal. So the formula, we have one half. So this is just in general. When you want to find the area of a polar region, the area is equal to, you have one half, and then you have your two angles that's creating the region, okay? So I like to think of this kind of like as a windshield wiper. It's like you're like swiping this way to see how much area you're highlighting. All right, sometimes it's a little bit more complicated. You know, like polar curves have the ability to twist and turn. But for these rose curves, they behave kind of nice. Okay, so we have one half theta one to theta two of r squared d theta. And now I'm gonna have one half and we're going from negative pi over 10 to pi over 10. And our r equation is we have three cosine of five theta squared like this d theta. Okay, and now this we can just type in the calculator. So I'm just gonna go to y equals and I'm gonna write the function here. So our r equation here, we have three cosine of five theta. And now I'll go back to the main screen and we're just gonna type in this integral. For one half, I could just write 0 0.5. And now I have math nine and we're going from negative pi over 10 to pi over 10. Okay, so I'm just gonna type our limits here. And then we're gonna have r squared. Okay, so I could type it in manually like this, but if I have it saved in the r equals spot, I could press alpha trace and then r1, okay? And then square it. This just guarantees that I'm gonna write it neatly. That's why I like using this little shortcut here. And then we write our d theta, we press enter, and this is gonna give us the area of one petal. Now, one thing to be careful of, some students may not read carefully and they'll say, oh, there's five petals and go times five. And notice that, of course, this answer choice is waiting for you. But choice D is a very dangerous polar bear trap, okay? Just make sure you read carefully. We should be getting choice B. Question 12, which of the following represents the graph of the polar curve R equals negative two secant theta? And for this question, it helps to know how to go back and forth from rectangular to polar coordinates. So we have X equals R cosine theta, and we have Y equals R sine theta. So for the equation that we were given, we could write this equation here as r equals negative two, and then secant theta is one over cosine theta. So I could say negative two over cosine theta. And now for this part, I could just cross multiply, and I'm gonna have r cosine theta is equal to negative two times one is negative two. But then look at these equations over here, x equals r cosine theta. So if I wanna bring this back to rectangular, like back to that world, I could replace r cosine theta with x. And then I'm looking for the graph of the line x equals negative two. And scanning through the answer choices, we could see that this is matching up with choice D because x equals negative two is a vertical line that crosses the x-axis through negative two. Now, if this were a calculator question, we could just go over here and do this and we could type in negative two. Secant is one over cosine. So I could just write negative two over cosine theta like this. And we press graph. And notice that we get a vertical line through x equals negative two. So our graph over here is looking good. Question 13, let r equals f of theta be the polar curve whose equation is given by this r equals equation here. And we wanna know what is the slope of the line tangent to f of theta at the point where theta equals pi over two. So for this question here, we have to know what is the equation for dy dx when we're talking about polar curves. So for this one, this is a formula that I forget all the time, but this is how I remember it. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for dy d theta over dx d theta. Okay, so this is very similar to how we derive a parametric equation, but we're gonna do this with a polar equation. And now what we wanna remember from before, what I had on the last page was we have x is equal to r cosine theta, and we have y is equal to r sine theta. So when I'm coming up with the equation for dy dx, I just go ahead and do the product rule twice to build our equation for dy dx. So in the numerator, what I'm doing is I'm doing dy d theta first. Okay, so we have y equals r sine theta. So we're gonna take the derivative of r sine theta with respect to theta though. So the derivative of r, don't just say one, the derivative of r is dr d theta. 
Okay, so I'll just make that neater. We have dr d theta, and we're multiplying by sine theta. And now to complete the product rule, we have plus r times the derivative with respect to theta of sine theta is cosine theta. So that's the numerator in the in this part of our equation. So now next we're finding dx d theta. So now I'm going to shift my focus over here to dx d theta. So I'm going to be deriving the x equals equation over here. So we're going to have the derivative of r with respect to theta is still dr d theta. And then we have times cosine. And now I'm going to leave the plus out for a moment. We have plus r times the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So now I write minus sine theta. So this is a formula that you should know, but if you don't have this formula memorized, it's okay. I, li I do literally do this every single time, okay? I have to build this formula from scratch. So if it's something that you feel more comfortable with doing, you know, I would trust learning the techniques and getting really good at the basics because it's gonna make it less stressful that you won't have to memorize formulas like this. So now I just go piece by piece. So pi over two is what we're plugging in, but we need to know two things. We need to know what is r at pi over two. So r at pi over two, I'm just plugging into the original r equals equation. So we have negative two times theta to the third power. So I have pi over two to the third. And this is gonna work out to negative two pi to the third over, we have two to the third power is eight. So this will simplify to negative pi to the third over four. Okay, but I also need to know what is dr d theta. So for dr d theta, this I could just derive the original equation with respect to theta. So the derivative on the right is just negative six. I'm just doing the power rule and then theta squared. So now I'm finding dr d theta specifically at pi over two. So when theta is equal to pi over two, and if we plug that into this derivative here, so I'll just make this a little bit neater. So we have, we're plugging this into this derivative here. We're gonna have negative six and then times pi over two squared, which gives us negative six pi squared over four, which simplifies to negative three pi squared over two. Now to complete this, we're just gonna plug everything into this equation now. Okay, so we wanna know what is the slope of the tangent line specifically at pi over two, okay, so at theta equals pi over two. So now we plug in dr d theta at pi over two was this, we had, this was equal to, we have negative three pi squared over two times sine of theta, sine of pi over two is one, so we have times one. And then we have plus r is this value here, but cosine of pi over two is zero. So I'm just really multiplying that last piece by zero, so that's just gonna wipe out. And then on bottom, notice I have another cosine pi over two. So whatever this piece is here, it's just gonna wipe out and make zero. And then we have minus r at pi over two is equal to, we have negative. So I'm gonna put a minus and we have pi to the third and then over four times sine of pi over two is one. So now we could clean this up a little bit. On top, all we're left with is negative three pi squared over two, and then on bottom here, we have minus minus going plus is gonna make pi to the third over four. And now we could just simplify this here. We have, we're gonna do keep change flip. We have negative three pi squared over two times the reciprocal is four over pi to the third. And now what we have here, four over two simplifies to two, and then pi squared wipes out completely and pi to the third becomes pi to the first. So now we have negative three times two is negative six. And then the denominator here is just pi to the first. Okay, so that's gonna match up with choice A. If a calculator was an option here, what we could do is we could go to R equals and type in negative two and then theta to the third. And then really, really quickly, we could just press second trace dy dx and then plug in pi over two. So I have second, this up arrow, pi over two. And notice I get this decimal value here. So I'm gonna press second mode to get out of this. Second and the minus sign to pull up the answer. And now if I write in negative six over pi, our correct answer, notice that we do get a match here. So our answer is good. Question 14, we have the graphs of two polar curves with the equations given here. And we wanna find the area of the region inside of r equals two plus two cosine theta and outside of r equals three. So for questions like this, you wanna be able to identify which function matches with which graph. So r equals three 
is the equation of a circle when we're in the polar world. Because with the circle, the radius doesn't change. Okay, so we know that this is our circle, r equals 3. And the other function here is a cardioid function, and that's the 2 plus 2 cosine theta. So now think very carefully about this part. We want to be inside 2 plus 2 cosine theta. So we want to be inside of this cardioid, but outside of the circle. So that's referring to this space here. So you want to make sure you spend a little bit of time being very careful to identify what region you're actually taking or finding the area of. And notice that this region here is a space between two polar curves, and that space is away from the origin. So that tells us that we're going to be using this formula here. We have one half, the integral from theta one to theta two, and then we have the outside radius squared minus the inside radius squared. Okay, so this is the formula that we want to use. And for this, we have to be able to identify what's the outside and inside function in this region here. And the outside function is the one that's farther away from the origin zero, zero. So notice that this would be our outside function, and then this circle here would be our inside function. So then the last thing that we have to be able to identify is the measure of the angles here. So I'm looking from the point zero, zero, the angles are referring to the angles that I have to think about over here that kind of section off this entire region, okay? So where does this region start? in terms of theta and where does it stop? So for this, if, we're if this information is not given to us, I'm gonna pretend also that we don't have a calculator for this part. We're gonna set these two equations equal to each other. So this is one of the parts of trig that you have to be good at, all right? If you're not good at this, you know, you can still do well on the AP calculus test, but make sure that this part of your pre-calculus is strong for the second part of unit nine. You wanna be comfortable with finding multiple solutions to trig equations. So I'm gonna subtract two on both sides and we have one is equal to, and then we have two cosine theta. And now I'm gonna divide both sides by two and that's gonna give us this equation here. We're gonna have cosine theta equals, and we're gonna have the ratio one half. So now we have to know our trig values for this part. If we don't have a calculator, we're gonna say theta equals, and we're gonna have pi over three. Now, one thing we could say here is we could use this concept, the AST, the ASTC concept, and say that cosine is also positive when we use angles that terminate in quadrant four. If I plug in an angle between three pi over two and two pi radians into cosine, I'm going to get a positive ratio. So if I think here, pi over three is my original angle my and also my reference angle. If I chop off pi over three and then I spin from standard position, I could say that this angle over here is five pi over three. But the problem with this, in this case here, I'm not, so I'm gonna say here, don't. Don't set up this integral from, let's say pi over three to five pi over three. Because the problem with this, if you're starting here and stopping here, notice that we're spinning this entire space here and we are not talking about the highlighted region. So you really do wanna be very careful with this part here when you're choosing your limits of integration. Think very carefully. The concept I like to think of is the windshield wiper. I think of choosing my angles as almost like how a windshield wiper functions. So what I wanna think about is my blade of my windshield wiper. I wanna time it when it's in this location here, and I wanna see it spin all the way to this location here. So I wanna, once again, I wanna start here, and I want to stop up here. That's my goal. So I'm not gonna use five pi over three. There's another way to think about this angle down here. Another way to think about it, if I'm using symmetry, is that if this angle up here is pi over three, then this angle over here is minus pi over three. So notice if I'm going from negative pi over three to pi over three, I'm going this way. I'm using that windshield wiper motion to swipe that entire area, okay? So now I'm ready to set up my integral. So I'm going once again from negative pi over three to pi over three. That's the best way to set this up. So we're gonna have one half, the integral from negative pi over three to pi over three. And now we have our outside function squared. So our outside function is the cardioid. That's the two plus two cosine theta in parentheses here squared. And then we have minus our inside function is r equals three. So we have minus three squared. And now we just tack on d theta and the rest we just type in the calculator. So I'll go over to the y equals, and I'm just gonna type in both of these equations here. So we have our first equation, I'm gonna say our outside function is two plus two cosine theta. Okay, and then the 
second function here, our inside, our inside function is r equals 3. So now I'm just going to type in everything that we have over here. So we're going to have 0 0.5 and then math 9. And our integral is going from negative pi over 3 to pi over 3. Okay, so we're going from here to here. And now let's just write it in. We have pi over 3. But then our integrand is the outside function squared. So I have alpha trace um, r1 this time. So our outside radius, we typed in the r1 spot and we square it. And then we have minus, and we're going to press alpha trace to pull up r2. And we have r2 squared. Okay, and then we're going to the right here to, and we're just going to write in our d theta. And press enter, and then this is going to give us the area of the region. So now we just scan the answer choices, and this is going to match up with choice C. And now question 15, our last multiple choice question. We have these two polar curves here. And what we want to do is find the total area of the shaded regions. So for this one here, we have to be careful. We are not going to be using this formula here. So don't use 1 half. And then we have the integral from theta 1 to theta 2 of outside radius squared minus inside radius squared. Okay, so this is a common mistake with questions like this. People see two curves and they just assume they're going to be using this. But we have to think here, why aren't we using this formula? Well, if you notice that the space between the curves is resting on the origin like this. Like notice that the origin zero, zero is a part of this region. Okay, so yes, we are between two curves. However, there's a lot of symmetry going on in this graph here that we can make use of. What we could do is we could find the area of just this space here. So let's say the top half, I could find the area of this portion here that I'm highlighting in yellow, and that's bounded by the X axis and the red curve. I could find this area here and just multiply it by two. Okay, so if we want to determine here which of these equations matches the red graph, we could just use the calculator, but it's going to be the first one. Okay, and I know this because if I were to just make a quick table for this, so I have my values theta and my values for r, if I plugged in, let's say theta equals zero, sine of zero is zero, and three minus zero is going to give us three. So I would have r is equal to three when theta equals zero, and that means when I'm pointing in the direction of theta equals zero at this angle, I go out three units. And you see how it puts me here. But then when I go pi over two, if I plugged in pi over two for theta, I'd have three minus two times sine of pi over two is one and three minus two is equal to one. So what this would tell me is when I'm facing theta equals pi over two, when I'm facing north, I'm gonna go up one unit. And notice that it puts me on the red curve. So, so far I have theta equals zero puts me here. This is first, second, and then if I plugged in pi, so for the last point here, if I plug in pi, I'd have three minus two times sine pi, sine pi is zero. So that would just give me three minus zero is three. And this tells me to face west. So when I'm plotting polar points, I'm facing in this case west, I'm facing theta equals pi, and I go out three units. So something as simple as, or I guess this is not simple, but you should learn how to plot polar points. So that in situations like this, it helps you figure out where to start and stop your integral. Okay, because now what I know to do is I'm gonna find the area under the red curve, okay, under this red polar curve here, and I'm gonna start at zero and I'm gonna stop at pi. Okay, and I'm plugging in, we have three minus two sine theta. And this is gonna be squared, okay, because the formula for the area under one polar curve, we just have one half integral r squared d theta like this. Okay, but remember, this is going to be symmetric. The area of this space here is also the same as the area above it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to multiply all of this by 2. Okay, and you can see when I do 2 times a half, the 2 times a half are, are just going to cancel out, and we're going to be left with the integral from 0 to pi of our integrand. We're going to have 3 minus 2 sine theta squared. Okay, so when it comes time to type this in the calculator. I'm just typing in this integral expression. So we have math nine, pulling up the integral. We're going from zero to pi. And now we have our integrand. I'm gonna put parentheses. And we have three minus two sine theta. And now I have to close the parentheses around the theta. And then I have to close it around the three minus like this whole binomial here. And then I attach my square. So just be careful when you're typing this in on the main screen. If you need to, just type it in the R equals and then use the shortcut just to make sure that you're very precise here. And now we press enter 
and this is gonna be our solution. So the total area of the shaded regions is gonna match up with choice B. So now let's look at the free response questions and we can use a calculator for this section. And for the first question here, we have an ant crawling on a wall in such a way that the position of the ant can be represented by X of T, Y of T, and the X, Y plane, which is graphed above. And then we have the ant's initial position at T equals zero is, and then we have the point zero two here. Okay, so this is telling us the ant's position at time zero. And then we're told that the ant crawls for three seconds on the wall and we're on this interval here from zero to three and we're given dx dt and we're given dy dt. So first we're gonna find the speed of the ant at time t equals two seconds and we have to show the work that leads to our answer. So let's define our speed function here, s of t as we're gonna say that this is our speed function and this is gonna be equal to, we're gonna have a jumbo square root and speed is the square root of dx dt squared. So I'm gonna take the x velocity and square it. So I have two, cosine of t squared plus one. And I close the parentheses around the inside of the cosine function. And then I close it around the entire function like this and then square it. And then we have plus, and I'm gonna square the y velocity as well. So we have three sine, and then inside the sine function here, we have t to the third over, and then we have e to the two t. Okay, so we close the parentheses twice and then square it. So here's our speed function, and if we wanna find the speed of the ant at time t equals two seconds, we're just gonna plug in two to this, and for this, we'll just use the calculator. So for this part here, I would rather be in function mode, and I'm just gonna type in the speed function over here. So we're gonna have the square root of, and we have parentheses first, and then we have two cosine, and we have x squared plus one. So we're gonna use x instead of t here. And then I'm gonna close the parentheses around the inside, and then I'm gonna close it around the entire function here and then attach my square. So just be very careful with the parentheses at this step. And now I'm gonna open a parentheses and write in the y velocity here. So we have three sine. And now for this part, I'll write alpha y equals enter. And we're gonna have the fraction, instead of t, we're using x. So we have x to the third over e to the two t power. Okay, so this is what we have. And now I get out of this, I close it, and then I close it again, and then square it. So here's our speed function. And now what I'll do is I'll go back to the main screen. Our goal is to evaluate the speed function at t equals two seconds. So I'm gonna press alpha trace y1, because now I have my speed function saved. And I'm gonna put a parentheses two and then close it. Okay, and I press enter, and here's our numerical value of the speed. I could also just press second graph here. And let's say I switch this to auto and I look at the table and notice that at t equals two, that I get the same exact value that we have on the main screen, but I just like using this function feature here. So here's our speed. So our speed is gonna be zero point, and then we have 717 if we round to three decimal places. We have 717, and the units here, x and y are both measured in centimeters. We have centimeters per, and the unit of time is seconds. So we're gonna have centimeters per second. So here's the speed of the ant at time t equals two. For part B, we wanna find the total distance that the ant travels from t equals zero to t equals three seconds. And we have to show the setup for our calculations. So what we're gonna have here is we're going to integrate the speed function, okay? So we're going to say here the integral from zero to three, and we're gonna have, I could just rewrite this entire expression here. So I could just say that we have the square root of, and we're gonna have two cosine of t squared plus one, and then I'm gonna square this entire thing like this. And then we have, next we have three sine, and then we have t to the third over e to the two t power, okay? And then we close the parentheses twice and then square it, okay? And we'll just extend the square root like this. And then make sure to tack on a dt. So this integral, we're just gonna evaluate in the calculator. So now we'll integrate the speed function. We're gonna press math nine, and we're going from zero to three, and remember, the speed function is still saved in the y1 spot. So I'm just gonna go inside this integral here to the integrand and press alpha trace and then y1. And then I'll tack on dx at the end. So here is the total distance that the particle travels, or I'm sorry, not the particle, the ant, that the ant travels from zero to three seconds. So now let's record our answer. The ant travels 3.617 centimeters from t equals zero to t equals three seconds. Part C, we wanna find the ant's position at time t equals 1.5 seconds, and we're gonna show the setup for our calculations. So for this part here, what we wanna think of 
is this idea that the integral of the rate tells us the net change of the function. So if I want to find, let's say, the change in position in the x direction, I would integrate the x velocity, or in this case, I could say dx dt, or I could say x prime of t if I'm thinking about it like this. So the integral of x prime of t from, let's say, a to b is equal to, I would have x of b minus x of a. So this is really just the fundamental theorem of calculus going on here. I'm anti-deriving the integrand, and then I plug in the upper and lower limit and subtract. So I could just rearrange this and say that x of b is equal to, and I would have, if I add x of a to both sides, I would have x of a plus the integral from a to b of x prime of t dt. Okay, so this is the concept that I want to use for this part here, okay, for part c. So the ant's position at time t equals 1.5 seconds. I could say x of 1.5 is equal to x of 0. And I'm using x of 0 because, once again, we know what's happening at t equals 0. So we could say here that x of 0 is equal to 0, and we could also say that y of 0 is equal to 2. We'll just make that a little bit neater. So we have y of 0 is equal to 2. And now I just plug into the formula. I have x of 0 plus the integral from 0 to 1.5 of x prime, or dx dt, and I'll just write it out explicitly. I'm going to say 2 cosine of t squared plus 1, and then dt. Okay, and then when I want to find the y position at t equals 1.5 seconds, I'm going to plug in 1.5 into the y formula here. So I'm going to say y of 1.5 is equal to y of 0, and then plus the integral from 0 to 1.5 of the y velocity is this equation over here. So we're going to plug in, we have 3 sine of t to the third, and we're dividing this by e to the 2t. Okay, so this will get us the ant's position at t equals 1.5 seconds. But for this part here, we're just going to use the calculator to find these values. So we'll just type this in. x of 0, we set as 0, so we have 0 plus, and then we're going to pull up the integral here. So we have math 9, and we're going from 0 to 1.5. And then we have dx dt going on the inside. So we have 2 cosine, and let's make sure we hit the right arrow to get to the integrand. So we have 2 cosine, and then we have x squared plus 1. I could use t squared plus 1, but I'll just use x because you need to press less buttons to get the x up there. All right, and then we have dx. So here is the x position at t equals 1.5 seconds. And now for the y position, we're going to use, we have y of 0 plus the integral. But y of 0, be careful here, is equal to 2. So don't forget the initial position, because that's a common mistake. People forget to write that initial position, and then it throws the question off by a little bit. So we're going 2 plus the integral from 0 to 1.5. And now we have dy dt on the inside. Okay, so we have we have that function. I'll just go down here so we could copy this. So we have three sine. And then inside the sine function, we have a fraction. So I'll press alpha y equals enter. And we're gonna have t to the third, but I'll use x. And then in the denominator, we have e to the two t. So second ln, and then the exponent is two t, but I'll use two x. Okay, and then I could close the parentheses around the sine function here, this part here, but that's not necessary, but I'll just do it anyway. And now we tack on dx, and this is going to give us the y position at t equals 1.5. So now we just record our answers here. So we have negative 0.338, so that is the x position at t equals 1.5, and then the y position is going to be at 2 point, and then we have 396 if we round, so 2.396. So now I'll just write this as an ordered pair, so we have the ant's position at t equals 1.5 is going to be negative 0.338 in the x direction. We'll just clean that up a bit. So we have 338. And then the y position is going to be 2.396. Okay, so here is our solution to part C. So now for part D, we want to find the time t where t is between 0 and 3 when the ant is farthest to the left. So for this question here, what you need to do is just really think about what this question is asking you to find. So when they say, when is the ant farthest to the left? Left and right, you should be thinking of the x position, so x of t. So what they're really asking us to do, if they want to know when is the ant farthest to the left, is they want us to find the absolute minimum. So we want to find the absolute minimum value of x of t. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here. And to find the absolute minimum of this function, 
we're going to take the derivative of this function. So we're going to take dx dt, and that's equal to 2 cosine of t squared plus 1. And we're going to set this function equal to 0. And then whatever we get for the solutions here, we're going to make a table for x of t. So we're going to make a table for x of t, and we're going to find the position of the ant, the x position, at the endpoints 0 and 3. And we're also going to find the x position of the ant at whatever critical points come out of this. So we could go over to the y equals here, and we'll type in the dx dt function here. So we have 2 cosine of t squared plus 1, but we'll use x. And remember, for this question, we're on the interval here from 0 to 3. So I'm going to go to the window, and I'm going to change the x minimum to 0 and the x maximum to 3. And first, I just want to find out when is the x velocity equal to 0. So I'm going to press graph. And notice what we have here. We have 1, 2, 3 roots. Okay, so we're going to have to check these three values here. And technically, I only have to check the minimum value where there's a sign change from negative to positive. But just to play it safe, what we could do is we could check all three. So what I'll do is I'm going to graph the line y equals 0. And from here, once I do this, now I could just trace the intersection of the red line and the blue curve. So I'm going to press second trace number five. And I'll go to the first critical point over here. So I'm here and I'm going to press enter three times. So here is our first critical point. And what I like to do is I press second mode to quit this. I press second answer. And then I store this as the letter A. So I'm going to store this as alpha math. That way, when in a moment I type this into an integral, I don't have to keep retyping all of this stuff. Okay, so that's just, that's just going to make this like much smoother. And now I do second trace five again, and I'm going to trace the next point of intersection. Remember, you if you're looking for an absolute minimum, you don't have to check the local maximums. Okay, and since this represents the derivative of x of t, the sign change here from positive to negative would make a local maximum. But just to play it safe, you could check all three. It's not wrong to check all three. Okay, and now I have the second critical point. I'm going to press second mode, second, the minus sign to pull up the answer. And I store this one as, let's say, the letter B. And once again, I'm doing this so I don't have to keep typing when I actually plug into the integral in a moment. And now finally, once more, second trace five, I get the last critical point here. Okay, so we have one more. And this one's going to occur at 2.618. Okay, so at 2.618, so now I press second mode to quit, second answer, and I'm going to store this one as the letter C. So now we have our three values. So now I'll just record these three answers down, and I'll call them T1, T2, and T3. So now that we have these values recorded, I could just write this in the table like this. I'm going to say at T1, T2, and T3. So now for this first part here, X of 0, we said before, the initial condition, X of 0 is equal to 0. So this part here is already done. But now to find the other values, I'm going to use the same idea from part C. To find x of t1, remember, x of 0 is just equal to 0. So what I basically have here is I have 0 plus the integral from 0 to whatever time I plug in. So this, I'm just going to once again use that idea from before to find the three function values here and then the one at the end point where t equals 3. So this was the integral from before in our history. So I'm just going to press enter on this and reuse it. And first, I'm going to evaluate this at t1. And remember, t1 I stored in the calculator as the letter a. So now I could just write alpha math and type in a. And I press enter. And this is going to give me my x position at the time t1 here. And then I could just repeat this over again. I could press enter. And I'm going to switch the upper limit to the letter b where I save t2. Okay, so alpha apps is going to put the letter b there. And then I do it once more. And this is going to give me the x position at time three, okay? Oh yeah, I do have to check the other endpoint at x or at t equals three, so I'll just do another integral after this. So alpha program to put the letter c here, and then finally I'll do this once more. So I'm gonna press, we're gonna have, once again, the integral, I'm gonna go up to here, and I'm gonna replace that letter c with three, and this is gonna give us everything that we need. So now I'll just record these values in the table. So here are all the values that we need. And remember, we're looking for where the ant is farthest to the left. So we just need to find the minimum value in this table here. And notice that the minimum value for the position is occurring here at t sub 2, 
when the position is at negative 0.877. Just know this notation here, when the calculator says e negative four, that just means multiply this by 10 to the negative four, which would make this a pretty insignificant decimal. It would put it really close to zero. So that's how I know t sub three is not the answer. So when we're recording the time, we're just gonna say at time t sub two, which is this decimal value here. Now, one thing we could do to check our answer, we could switch the calculator over to parametric. And there's a nice cool trick for how to graph these in the calculator. So if I look at the equations for dx dt and dy dt and the initial position, I could write in the x1 spot an equation for x of t. I could say it's zero plus and then math nine. And we have the integral from zero to t of dx dt, which is two cosine of, we have, t squared plus one. So I have t squared and then plus one. And then on the outside, I'm gonna write dt, okay? So I know this breaks the rules if you were to write this on paper. You should never make your variable here match the variable in your integrand, but the calculator doesn't mind. So now we have the initial y position at zero is two. So I have two plus, and then I'm gonna have math nine, and I have the integral from zero to t. And now I'm just gonna type in dy dt, okay? So I'm gonna write, we have three sine, alpha y equals enter, and we have t to the third, and this is over e to the 2t. Okay, so e to the 2t power, and then dt on the outside. And now if we press graph here, I'm gonna press zoom six. So let me just do that one more time. So we have the graph, zoom six to put it back to standard. And notice what we get here, but I'm gonna go ahead and restrict the domain from zero to three. So window, so I'm just gonna wait till this loads here because I kept the domain too big. So from zero to three, and then I don't need all this extra graph. Notice the graph is going from negative two to two and from negative one to four. So I'm gonna go on the X minimum from negative two to X maximum two, and then I'm gonna go from negative one to four. Okay, so watch what happens when I do this. It's gonna give us a picture that matches what we have here. All right, so this is just a cool way to be able to type in the parametric equations here. But once again, we have dx dt and dy dt, so we need to know that little trick if we wanna get a picture. But now we're claiming that the particle is farthest to the left at t sub two at negative 0 0.877, um, you know, seven, seven, whatever that worked out to. So what we have here, oh, I'm sorry, at t sub two, the x position is this, but t sub two is equal to this value. So watch what happens. I'm gonna press second trace value of one point, and we have 926 and then we have 756, and then 077. If I type this time in, notice that it puts me on the curve here, and this position here is definitely the point on the curve that is farthest to the left, all right? So our answer is looking pretty good. Question two, we have this polar curve defined by this equation here. The domain is theta is between zero and pi over two. And then we have let region R be the space in quadrant one, enclosed by the polar curve and the lines theta equals zero, and theta equals pi over two. So the first thing we wanna do for part A is find the area of R. And for this, we have to know the formula A equals, and we have one half the integral from theta one to theta two of the radius squared, okay? Or the equation R equals F of theta, okay? And then we just tack on D theta at the end. We use this formula when the region that we're finding the area of is determined by just one polar curve like this. Okay, so you could see that if I were to go from the origin to any point along the curve here, notice that I could go from the origin to any point here. So that's how I know I'm just gonna use this formula here. So I could say the area of R. So we have the area of R equals, and now we have one half the integral from zero to pi over two. And we're using zero and pi over two because remember that concept before the windshield wiper. If I start at theta equals zero, I'm facing this way. And as I go from theta equals zero to theta equals pi over two, notice that my windshield wiper is highlighting this entire space here. Okay, so that's how I know these limits of integration are good. And then R is equal to three plus, and we have two sine three theta. And then this whole part here in the integrand is being squared. Okay, so I close the parentheses around the whole thing and square it and I tack on D theta. And now I just type this in the calculator. So let's just switch the calculator over to polar and we're gonna to go to the y equals section here and notice that we have equations in the form of r equals and we're just gonna type in our equation three plus 
and then we have two sine three theta. Okay, so this is our equation here. And the first thing we're doing here for part A is we're evaluating this integral. So I'm gonna go back to the main screen and I'll clear this stuff out. And we have one half, so I'll use 0 0.5. And then we have math nine. We're going from zero to pi over two. And then next what we have is we have our equation, the R equals equation squared. So I'm just gonna do alpha trace R1 and then I'm gonna attach the square like this and then d theta. So this is gonna work out to 10.639. So here's the area of region R. Part B, we have to find the equation of the line that is tangent to the graph of R at the point where theta equals pi over three. And we have to show the setup for our calculations. So for this question, we'll just do all the work in the calculator first. So let's take a look at the graph of this function here. And notice that we have the entire graph here, but we were restricted to quadrant one from zero to pi over two. So I'll just restrict the domain here. And what we need to find is the equation of the line tangent to the graph at theta equals pi over three. So since we have a calculator for this part, I'm just gonna press second trace to calculate the value at pi over three. Okay, so at pi over three, if I just type this in, notice that I get my x and my y coordinate here. And then to write the equation of the line, I also need to know the slope at this point. So I could just press second trace and we have dy dx is option two, and we're interested in the slope at pi over three. Okay, so I'm gonna find the slope at pi over three, and I also get the slope. Now, if we had to show these values by hand, we could say something like x is equal to r cosine theta, and y is equal to r sine theta. Okay, so this would just be how we would show the work the long way, but we do have a calculator. So we could say that at theta equals pi over three, that, x equals 1.5 and y is equal to 2.598. Okay, so these are just the specific values that we're grabbing from the calculator. Now, if we wanted to show the work by hand, one thing we could do is find what is r equal to at pi over three. So I could say that r of pi over three is equal to, I would have three plus two times sine of, and if I plugged in pi over three over here, Notice that three times pi over three would just cancel to make pi. So I would just have, th I would have three plus two sine pi. Sine of pi is zero, and that would just give us an r value of three. So if I wanted to do this by hand, I could say that x equals r is equal to three when we're at theta equals pi over three. So when theta equals pi over three, this would tell us if we did this by hand, that x is equal to three times cosine at pi over three. And cosine of pi over three is equal to a half. Three times a half is equal to 1.5. Okay, so that's where 1.5 is coming from. And then y, if I were to do it this way, r is still equal to three, but now I have sine of pi over three. And sine of pi over three is square root three over two. So this would be three radical three over two. And you could even check it out if you were to type this in, rounded to three decimal places would give you this. And now for this part, the slope, we can just say that dy dx at theta equals pi over three is equal to, and we'll round to three decimal places, is equal to, we're gonna have 0 0.660. If we had to show this the long way, we would use the formula dy dx is equal to, and I'm gonna write down the same formula from before. Remember from before, we had dr d theta sine theta, and then we had plus r cosine theta. And then we divide by dr d theta cosine theta and then minus r sine theta. Okay, so if we want to do this the long way, we would actually have to find that dr d theta, I'll write it over here, dr d theta, if we derive this by hand, is going to be zero plus, we would have to use the chain rule here, the derivative of two sine three theta with respect to theta. We'd have two cosine three theta times three, which would make this six cosine three theta. Okay, so then we'd have to replace dr d theta with this. We'd have to plug in pi over three for everything. Okay, r would still be equal to three at theta equals pi over three, but this is gonna be a complete mess. But it would at the end simplify to 0 0.660. So once again, if you do get a calculator for a question like this, I would just mention that at theta equals pi over three, that x is equal to 1.5 and y is equal to 2.598. And then we are ready to write the equation of the tangent line. So we're gonna say that our tangent line equation is y minus 
and the y value here is 2.598 and now this is equal to we're going to have 0 0.660 times x minus the x coordinate here is 1.5 okay so here is the equation of our tangent line at theta equals pi over 3. Part C, we have the line y equals mx, and we want to write but not solve an equation involving m such that the line divides the section of the graph of r in the first quadrant into two regions of equal area. So for this question, what I'm imagining, we have the line y equals mx, which is going to come out of the origin, and we want this line to cut region r in half. Okay, so this is what I'm seeing here. And what we want to think about, this is the line y equals mx, we want to think about what angle does this line form with the x-axis? Okay, so we could call this angle over here, let's call this angle over here theta. Okay, so here's theta, and what we have is we're gonna say y equals mx. We're gonna solve for m because our equation has to involve m. So I'm gonna say m is equal to y over x. And now we are in the polar world, so let's swap out y and x with their polar equations. y is equal to r sine theta and x is equal to r cosine theta. And now r over r cancels. Sine over cosine is equal to tangent. So this tells us that m is equal to tangent theta. So if I want a value for theta in terms of m, I could just take the tangent inverse of both sides and say that theta is equal to tangent inverse of m. Okay, and what this just told us is that our integral that we're gonna set up in a moment is gonna go from zero to tangent inverse m. Okay, so that's the angle that we're starting with and the angle that we're gonna stop with. So now let's go ahead and set up our integral. So for this part, we could describe the area of either half. We could go from zero to tangent inverse m, or we could go from tangent inverse m to pi over two. So what we're gonna set up here, we have one half, the integral from zero to tangent inverse m. So now we're describing the area of this part of region R, this section here. Okay, so we have one half, the integral, and we're gonna throw r squared on the inside. So we have three plus two sine, and then we have three theta going on the inside like this. Okay, we close the whole thing and we square it d theta, but let's think about this. We're just setting up the equation, we're not solving. We have to think about what does this integral represent? It represents the area of this half of region r. But in part a, we found the area of the entire region. So we could say that this value here is equal to one half of the entire area, which when we rounded was 10 point and we have 639. If we wanna write out more significant digits, we can include more. We could say 3798 after, but since we rounded what we had in part A, we could stop here. But once again, if you wanna include more, you could just say 3798. We're just borrowing the values from the calculator before, but this is going to be our solution to part C.